all now set up and ready to go. Um, wonderful to see there's a there's a couple of people um, in the chat room. But basically, I'm going to talk for a few minutes, about maybe about half an hour, just discussing exactly what I'll be doing at the amazing Contact in the Desert event, which will be taking place next weekend in Indian Wells in California. Um, it's quite frustrating, really, in that I was originally supposed to appear on this event in 2020, but because of COVID, the event never took place. And then the following year, there was an event whereby it was online. And um, we tried to link or they tried to link dozens of speakers from across the world, which became difficult logistically, I think. I think it would be fair to say. But I'm delighted to say now that um, the team have now got their act together and they've got a brand new um, contact in the desert taking place. Um, now, the location will be um, the Renaissance Indian Wells Resort and Spa. But if you want to buy tickets, you will need to go on to their website, which I will post later. So you have the details. But effectively, if you just do a search on contact in the desert 2023, you will get the details there and all you need to do. There are, there are various levels of tickets that you can buy and there are other additional events that you pay extra for, including my intensive that will be on the Monday. So effectively, the general event starts on Friday and runs through till, till late on Sunday. But effectively on the Monday morning, there is a series of intense, on Monday, there's a series of intensive that will be taking place in the hotel as well. Uh, and there'll be a handful of the, the, uh, the speakers doing that and I'll be one of those. So just to let you know exactly what I'm planning to do and what I'm planning to talk about. Well, I think the first thing is, this will be the first time I've had the opportunity to talk live to an American audience on my ideas and my writings and my various models of reality. I did do an event in New York around about 12 years ago um, at the Roosevelt Hotel in Madison Avenue, um, which around about 300 people turned up, which was really quite fantastic to see. Um, but um, this event, I would imagine, is going to be considerably larger than that. But for most people, I'm an unknown quantity. Um, most people that will be attending probably will have not heard of it heard of me. Surprisingly, some of the people that have been going there on a regular basis and have been going there for many years is my sister and brother-in-law who travel down from Canada for it um, every year. But unfortunately, they won't be able to make it this year um, for personal reasons. Um, but it's nothing to do with me turning up and doing it, by the way. <laughs> it's just that um, they have other things to do as well. OK, so what happens is then on the Friday um, um, at from 11.05, to 12.50 in the Atlantis room, I'll be doing um, a lecture. And this will be entitled The Non-Physical Entities and How They Can Influence Us. Um, what I'm really doing here is I'm attempting to discuss exactly what non-human entities are. When we encounter them, either they're, they're aliens or they are the fae, or they are the jinn, or various other things, ghosts, you know, um, med uh, voices that mediums hear and everything else as well. These are all things that have long fascinated me. And um, a few years ago, um, in 2019, um, I had a book published called The Hidden Universe. And this was putting forward a model whereby we can start to understand what these entities may be. Now, what is of importance here is that I expand my interests across all areas, but both, mostly the neurological and the scientific. So I'm particularly interested in people's encounters with things like Charles Bonnet syndrome and also a dimethyltryptamine facilitated encounters with um, the others um, or what uh, uh, Terence McKenna would call the machine elves. Now, I think I'm somewhat unusual in my approach to this because I want to understand the process. I want to not, I don't spend my time just analyzing what people experience. In other words, what they describe. I'm interested in, yes, of course, in what they describe, but I'm interested in trying to understand what's taking place in the brain at this time. You know, that is it, is it an hallucination? If it is an hallucination, what do we mean when we use the term hallucinations? So there's much more to this than simply a series of descriptions of people encountering aliens. It's far more than that. And I call this hypothesis, hypothesis the egregorial. And in my talk, uh, which will be uh, one hour and 45 minutes, I will be expanding in great detail in exactly what I mean by these entities. 
And I'll be making some what I consider to be quite important links to these that I think that academics and researchers should at least look into in terms of exactly what is going on in terms of this phenomenon. So then then for the rest of the day, I'm then going to be around um, wandering around, mixing with people, talking with people. And I know there is a number of my really good friends that are going to be coming along to this event. For instance, my great friend, Myron Dial, who is based in Los Angeles, the artist and um, temporal lobe experiencer, whose whose personal experiences very much tie into my writings. Myron will be there and a number of other people. But I'm also particularly excited to have um, uh, Alison, who is the American agent for the hypnagogic light machine, i.e. the Lucia machine, which I've talked about in a number of my books. We're, her and her team are going to be traveling over from Boulder in Colorado, arriving from Boulder, Colorado, to get to the event in Indian Wells. Uh, and they will be settling, with, due to my um, administrations, they have got a room in the hotel, which they'll be setting up a Lucia, which will give attendees to the audience, uh, attendees to the event, the opportunity to test out this extraordinary device. Now, I know that people will turn around and say, well, what's different about this light device to any other light device? We know from the work of um, Geisen onwards, you know, there's been this thing about flickering light and how it can cause altered states of consciousness. And I know there are a number of machines that are on the market at the moment doing this. But as far as I'm aware, and I may stand corrected, but this is the only machine that has actually been designed from the bottom up from the neurological correlates by a consultant neurologist and a consultant psychologist. So they were doing it from their knowledge of the brain and how the brain structures work and how the brain responds to light. Um, what is particularly interesting here as well is the machine uses some very, very complex uh, um, sort of software as well to, to build up the intensity of the experience. Now, again, as far as I'm aware, this is the only light machine that's been approved by medical professionals. Uh, I know that it, is, it has been approved by the, the German Medical Association and also the Swiss and possibly and the Austrian as well. And we know from those nations that, you know, they are very particular in the things that they allow to be used under medical circumstances. So that is, again, a, a fascinating opportunity to test out this machine in one way or another. Now, on top of that, and I'll be discussing this in one of my talks, which I'll mention later on, but um, one of the researchers um, who I met at Breaking Convention, which is a big event that uh, I attended at um, Exeter University a few weeks ago, um, has sent me um, an academic paper, that an academic research that has been done on the Lucia. And this is ex extremely intriguing. The Lucia is a very, very interesting device in terms of what it what takes place in the brain when you're experiencing it. And I'm also aware of research that's been done on the Lucia uh, at the University of Sussex over here in the UK. And they've been, people have been testing the Lucia device. And while they've been using it, um, they've had their brain scans, fMRI scans, these type of things. And what is in, in, incredibly interesting is that apparently the parts of the brain that light up or switch off, and this is a very interesting area that I'll be discussing in another of my, my presentations, is that they, um, they're exactly the same areas that are affected in the brain as if you're on psilocybin or magic mushrooms. So clearly there's a fascinating link here that can be drawn. Now, of course, from this, we can extrapolate to drawing up, you know, all the links here with endogenous dimethyltryptamine. And I suspect that what is taking place is that the, the Lucia machine actually stimulates possibly the pineal gland to synthesize melatonin into endogenous, that is internally generated DMT. Um, and again, I'll be talking about this in one of my talks. But suffice to say, though, so that machine will be there and I'll be spending most of my time with those guys. So I'll be around to chat with everybody else as well. You know, I'm, you know, people who know me know that when they go to events, I'm, I'm not an aloof person. I, I want to talk. I want to meet in groups. I want to discuss my ideas. It's my ideas that are important, not me. And it's the ideas and the feedback I get from you guys that is profoundly important. And that's why I think this event is so important because of that. Now, then in the evening, there's this incredible event that um, will be part of your ticket if you buy the, the weekend ticket. And it's extraordinary. It, from 9 p.m. to 10.30 p.m., there's what's called the Close Encounter Meet and Greet Your Speakers 
Uh, and this is a kind of a dinner party and a dinner event. But it also seems like speed dating in that what's going to be happening is that members of the um, some of the speakers will be there and will be going from table to table. And we'll be sitting down at the table for a few minutes and chatting with the people on the table and discussing ideas. So to me, it sounds rather speed dating, but it could be quite a lot of fun because, of course, this gives me the opportunity all through that day and that evening to get people that are attending it to know about me. Because, you know, I'm nowhere near as famous as a lot of the speakers. I'm not up there with people like Graham Hancock, for example. But nevertheless, my ideas, I think when people actually start to listen to them, because it's never happened that this not happened with me, that people don't know about my work and they have a vague idea of what I write about. And then they come to one of my talks. And without exception, it's, wow, I had not realized that this work was going on. I hadn't realized what you were writing about and how powerful it is. And I'm hoping that that's what I'm going to happen there. Because what happens, and I know that some of you will know this, once you get involved in my work and our groups, it becomes, we all become friends. We're all working together for the same principles and ideas. That is rational, logical, scientific basis to look at extraordinary human experiences, to not dismiss them out of sight, but not be so naive and have such an open mind that your brain falls out. You know, we have to be scientific about this, because if we are going to take these ideas to the scientists and to prove them and to prove that extraordinary human experiences out of the body experiences, near-death experiences actually happen, we have to engage with the scientists. And we have got to be the kind of people that know the science to the extent that to a, a certain percentage that they know the science. We need to speak the language that they speak because then they can't dismiss us. We all know that materialist reductionist scientists love straw, straw men. They love smashing down people. And they also love smashing down the, the people it's easy to smash down. Myself and my group, we are not easy to smash down. We do the science. To an extent, we understand the quantum mechanics. We understand the neurology. We understand the neurochemistry. And there is something extraordinary going on. It doesn't mean that you have to believe utter nonsense. But by the same token, these things occur and occur across the world and occur to people all the time. And to just ignore them is bad science. For me, science develops by actually looking out from itself and looking at things empirically. The word empirical and empiricism is from experience. And we know that this event will be crowded with people who've had extraordinary experiences, they had encounters with UFOs, had encounters with greys, they've had been abducted. But to me, the abduction phenomenon, we need to look at it more, more closely because the abduction phenomenon is profoundly close to um, DMT experiences, shamanic experiences. There's something far broader going on here and we have to stop siloing it we have to realize that there's a pattern and we need to look at the pattern. So that's what's going to be happening in the evening. So that's going to be a, a great event and it's probably going to be a lot of fun for everybody. Um, I'm going to be profoundly jet lagged because I'll be flying in uh, the um, on the Thursday directly from uh, Gatwick. So I'm going to be a little bit knackered, but I will I'll keep up. I did an event in Australia a few years ago and I managed to get through that. But I'm what well, I'm six or seven years older now. So let's just see whether I just don't fall asleep in the corner like the dormouse, which is probably highly likely. In which case, if you're there, just wake me up, please. I'll be the little gray haired guy in the corner. Right then. So great for that. Then on the Saturday, um, it's going to be a good day for me on Saturday. Um, on Saturday um, at 8.30 a.m. to 10.15, I'm involved in a panel in the Crystal Ballroom. Uh, and the theme is going to be remote viewing. So what I'm going to be talking about, well, what I won't be talking about is I'm literally a part of a, a group and the host for it and the facilitator is a guy called Alan Steinfeld. And in the remote viewing group, there'll be Paul H. Smith, uh, JJ and Desiree Hertak and Tracy Garbutt Dolan. And the discussion will be about remote viewing. Now, my knowledge of remote viewing is purely and simply based upon the stuff I wrote in, in my book, The Out-of-Body Experience. I am aware of remote viewing. I'm aware of a lot of the cases of remote viewing. Um, I remain to be convinced about a lot of the cases on remote viewing. Um, but I think there's something intriguing going on. 
And again, it's evidence that possibly that consciousness is in some kind of a field and it can be linked in some way to lucid dreaming out of the body, out of body experiences and these kind of things. Um, so my involvement there will be probably vaguely sceptical, but that's good. And I think that's healthy. Then I've got the rest of the day is then is then I'm then free. Um, so for the rest of the day, I'll be wandering around. I'll be talking to people. I'll be liaising with people uh, and again, popping into the um, the the hypnagogic light device with Lucia event as well and and, and chatting with them as well and chatting with the people who've had those experiences and what i'm hoping is that some of the people who will have had the experiences with lucia or lucia will 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 seek me out to tell me their experiences because i'm looking for your experiences as well um so then um then at 6 30 to 8 80 p.m 880 there's no such time as 880 this is the details they've sent me but maybe this magical time of 880 there might be kind of like 666 who knows um but there's then a special event and it's in the mountain view room and it's an awards banquet i have no idea what is taking place there but i think it's open to everybody so that could be could be fun as well and when we get to 880 um we probably all disappear into um i don't know we probably get sucked into one of one of adamski's machines or something Right then, then, then I will hopefully have a, a quiet sleep because um, uh, and on Sunday morning, I have a very busy day, extremely busy. So at 1035 to 1220, um, I'm doing a workshop in the independence room. And I'm hoping that with this workshop, I will have the Lucia with me or one of the Lucias and members of the machine, of uh, the, uh, the team and the mem members of Allison's team. This is entitled Encountering the Daemon the divinity or supernatural being of the nature between gods and humans. Now, basically what this is, is me discussing the material I first put out in my book, The Daemon, A Guide to Your Extraordinary Secret Self, uh, yeah, The Daemon, A Guide to Your Extraordinary Secret Self, way back in 2008. And the concept of the daemon is absolutely central to my overall hypothesis, which I call cheating the ferryman. And put simply, I argue that we are all, all dual, we all exist in dual consciousness. And our higher self is, is, is always with us. And the higher self I call the daemon and the everyday self I call the Edelon. And what I'll be doing is for the first time ever, not only will I be discussing the historical background to this and the neurological background, but I'll also be discussing some, some things far more interesting. I'll be discussing ways and means that it's possible to communicate with your own daemon. And there are various techniques I've come across over the years. Some of them are absolutely fascinating to see whether the the as I call it, the doors of perception and the channels of communication. Well, it wasn't me that, that called that at all. Don't even call me out on that. It was it was uh, all subtly. But the doors of perception is something I've used as the argument. The communication with the daemon and the Adon is across the doors of perception or one would argue the corpus callosum in the brain. So what I'll be doing is I'll be taking you through systematically why the daemon concept works. But on top of that, I'll be explaining how it is that the daemon seems to understand and guide you through your life. You know, many people talk about get in touch with your higher self and your higher self can guide you. Nobody ever, with the exception of me, and I think I'm the only person on the planet that's doing this, is saying, well, how does, the, how does, the, how does your higher self know this? What, how does your higher self know how to guide you when your higher self doesn't know what's going to happen any more than you do? And I'll argue it's because your higher self does know what's going to happen next because it's lived your life before. It's as simple and as easy as that. Your higher self, your daemon, has lived your life before, not just once, but many, many times. So just like a game player that guides you through um, a game player guiding the on-screen sprite through a third-person computer game, it's exactly the same, same idea. The game player has played the game many times, therefore knows where the dangers lie. I argue this is the same with the daemon. The daemon knows where to go. And sometimes it plans things ahead to put you through some bad things to get you to the good things later on. And indeed, sometimes the daemon might actually just decide it wants to run through your life in a completely different way to what it's done before. And in doing this, I can explain such things as deja vu, precognition, many other phenomena. Um, and I think that hopefully this, this event will get my ideas across to a broader audience. Because I sometimes feel that an awful lot of researchers and writers I feel are fumbling around in the dark. They, 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 ha they haven't read my work, so therefore they, 
you know, they've not joined the dots and they need need to just look into my work so they can say whether, you know, I'm right or wrong or whether it makes logical sense or not. For most people, it makes logical sense. OK, so that's what the, 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 the Damon thing is going to be about. And also, we'll probably try and use the Lucia as well to open up the doors of perception in, in many ways and everything else as well. But also what I'll be doing in that presentation is I'll be discussing the broader concept of the Damon Adelon dyad, which I call it, and I'm calling it the quadrat. And I'm expanding this out because what I'm saying is not only is there a Damon and an Adelon, but at a higher level, again, there is something I call the uber daemon. And the uber daemon is like the collective unconscious of mankind. It's the Jungian collective unconscious. It's the memory stores that people have, for instance, when they do hypnotic past life regressions. They go into a past life, which wasn't them, but it was part of the greater consciousness field. And at a higher level, it is them. Because I argue very much from the Vedanta point of view that we are one single consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. And that singular consciousness is what I call the Godamon. And the Godamon is literally the consciousness of everything, both animate and inanimate. Because I argue that everything is information. Everything is information. The physical universe we think is here is actually made up of information. And that information is stored within the Godamon. And the Godamon is effectively, for want of a better term, God. So for the first time ever, you know, you've got a situation where you can you can actually point out that you are a kind of a theist, but using science to prove theism. OK, and to prove spirituality. And again, this is the tools I'm trying to give people when people they engage people and say what you believe all this spiritual nonsense. My argument is it's not nonsense. We're now doing the science of it. Um, you then you come back to me and say where I've got the science wrong. And I'm giving you the tools to do that. So that will be from 1035 to 1220. Then at 2 p.m. to 345 p.m., I'm back in the crystal ballroom. That sounds wonderful, that doesn't it? It sounds like something from, I don't know, um uh the Wizard of Oz, maybe, you know. <laughs> so maybe I should wear some little red shoes and click them together. Um, so, yeah. So then on, on the afternoon of the Crystal Ballroom, I'm on a panel and it's entitled AI Panel Communication with Non-Human Intelligences, which, of course, is right there with the stuff I'm writing about. So this is going to be a really exciting discussion. Now, the host is going to be uh, there are going to be two hosts. There's Jason Martell and Mitch Randall. And the members of the the uh, the, the panel will be Matthew James Bailey. Caroline Corey, who, who some of you may know is the person that does the show with uh, William Shatner um, uh, in terms of uh, the old Star Trek guy. Dr. Andrew Gallimore, Jim Elvidge, Paul Hynek and Adam Curry. Now, again, any of you that watch my um, my Anthony Peake Consciousness Hour and my Incon will know that both Dr. Andrew Gallimore and Jim Elvidge have both been previous guests on my show. Now, having us three on this panel is going to make it very, very interesting because I am a huge admirer of both of these individuals. Andrew Gallimore's work is extraordinary. His work on dimethyltryptamine, his research on dimethyltryptamine and his writings on the idea that this reality is some form of simulation. Uh, which he calls an instantation, which I'll talk about later in terms of my own talk. His work is really intriguing. He's one of the young up and coming academics, highly intelligent guy, lives in, in Japan, um, super qualified, really, really knows his stuff. And then you have uh, my great friend, Jim Elvidge. And Jim, a few years ago, wrote a wonderful book called The Universe Explained. And he's had a subsequent book written as well. And he and I resonate on the same level in terms of the idea of the simulation argument, the idea that there is strong evidence to assume that this is a holographic projection that we're existing within. And Jim's work, again, is extraordinary. And I strongly advise anybody to check Jim's work out and get along to his talks and indeed get along to Andrew's as well. You know, they're going to be good. The other guys, um, I, I don't know as well. I know them by name, but um, that is going to be a very interesting discussion. Remember, these panels are open. There, there are panels. And I think we're going to be swapping ideas, and I'm not sure whether we're going to be opening it up to the audience or not. But that sounds really good and very interesting. Then I have a little bit of a rest. And then at 7.45 to 9.30 p.m., 
I'm back in the crystal ballroom, um, uh, you know, looking for Toto. And in the crystal ballroom at that time, maybe there'll be uh, the Wizard of Oz behind a screen at the back or something. Um, I'll be discussing UFOs, spirituality, evil, the evolution of consciousness. Now, this is going to be a really good one. The hosts are Alan Steinfeld, again, from the earlier host, and Graham Hancock. And the team, again, will be Caroline Corey, Adam Apollo, again, Dr. Andrew Gallimore, again, Jim Elvidge, and again, Paul Hynek, and uh, Dr. Jeffrey Long. So this is going to be a very interesting panel. We have a very interesting mix of, of knowledge areas here that are coming to coming together. Now, I, um, I saw Graham Hancock speak um, at uh, Breaking Convention at the University of Exeter a few weeks ago, and I had the opportunity to have a very quick chat with him about the, the events that we're going to be doing together. So I'm very, very interested in this. Huge admirer of Graham Hancock. I've cited his work in the past. And around about 10 years ago, I was his author of the month on his website. Um, Graham, as you know, is an incredible researcher, incredibly specific. And I, I, I identify with Graham very, very, very much because both Graham and I are kind of hardworking outsiders that the, the, the general field just don't, don't engage with us. And they don't engage with us for very good reasons because we walk the walk and talk the talk. So this is going to be a fascinating discussion at the, the Crystal Ballroom. Um, then I can rest. And the next day, I've got the rest of the day free until 5 p.m. Um, and I'm hoping to probably go along to one or two of the other intensives that are taking place. Now, these intensives are really worth going to. They're three hours long. Now, for instance, in the afternoon, I know that in the first thing in the morning, I know that Andrew Gallimore has got one very early in the morning, around about eight o'clock. And I guess that's because he's having to fly back to Japan. Um, then Graham is doing one in the afternoon, um, which it before mine. So this is perfect. So you could go you could go to Andrew's if you wished, then go to Graham's. You, you could do nine hours in one day if you were willing to do that. I'm sure your brain would explode, but you could try and do that if you want. But it could also run quite expensive. The reason being that the Monday is the additional day of the event. So it's not part of the main event. It's the additional day. So you'd need to stay over an additional night or possibly even two nights, but you get the intensives, but you do have to pay for the intensives. These are in addition. Everything else I've mentioned, you you just attend. Whereas the the intensive is, you know, it's a one to one for three hours with the speaker in question. So my one will go from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. And it's for the first time ever. I'm going to be doing the science of my cheating the ferryman hypothesis. And my are my ideas on the holographic universe. Now, it's it's entitled the holographic universe, the science and the implications. Now, my intentions in this are quite ambitious. I'd like to believe by the end of that three hours, you will be able to engage directly with quantum physicists and cosmologists at a much deeper level than just saying, isn't quantum physics strange? I'm going to be taking you through in detail why the twin slit experiment is so strange. I'm going to be taking through in detail the implication of Schrodinger's cat. I'm then going to be taking you through the incredible extrapolation from Schrodinger's cat to something called the quantum suicide experiment with thought experiment, which was first suggested in the mid 1990s by Professor Max Tegmark. So I'm going to be taking you through exactly why that's so strange. But in, to, to do so, I have to break, take, take you right back to the basics of what exactly is reality. What, is, what are the solid objects we think we believe are around us? How solid are they? What are they really made of when we really drill down into them? I'll be doing literally what modern scientists do, that is um, material reductionism. I'll be reducing and redu reducing physical objects down to their component parts. Because then when you realize this, Suddenly, Schrodinger's cat and everything else doesn't seem quite so strange. So I'll be taking you through the, uh, the, the Schrodinger equation, waveforms, everything else as well. From there on, I will then move on to why it is that certain scientists believe that the universe is a hologram. And again, I'm not just going to be saying, oh, it's a hologram because it's a hologram. I'll be taking you right into the logic and the science 
I'll be quoting and citing the work of people such as Stephen Hawking and Frank Hartle and various other, other research scientists, people who are very interested in the nature of black holes, exactly what are black holes, and what can black holes tell us about the nature of reality? What happens to information when it's sucked into a black hole? These are all profoundly important concepts, and they're all pointing in one direction, that at its basic level, reality is mathematical. It's mathematical and it's digital. The question is, what is it then? And how does consciousness interface with that external reality? And if we can discover that there's a direct relationship between consciousness and external reality, and we know this from something called the collapse of the wave function, that this means that my Godemon, my Uber Damon, and everything else, and even the Damon and the Edelon themselves, there is no out there. There is no in here. It's all the same thing. It's entangled, to use the quantum physics phase. All the subatomic particles are all elements of the same thing. It's pure Vedanta in terms of this. It's non-dual. You know, there is no, there's consciousness and then there's the brain. They're the same thing. Everything is information. And this is what I'll be doing in this talk. And then at the end of it, I'll then be drawing in all my work for the last two decades. And I'll be explaining how this model can explain my cheating the ferryman hypothesis. And I will give you evidence that you are immortal. I will give you irrefutable evidence from science, not from telling people's experiences, from actual science, that the implications are that we are immortal beings. It's powerful and it's, it's persuasive. And what I'm hoping is at the end of that three hours, you guys can go out there and you can engage with people. You can engage with your friends. When your friends who are science scientists and they dismiss you, they're not going to be able to dismiss you anymore. That's gone. That's not going to happen. You're going to be able to engage with them and you're going to be able to ask them questions that they can't answer. Because they can't. Because the big question, the, the quantum mechanics at the moment is a mystery wrapped up in an enigma. There will be terms you'll be able to use to your scientific friends that will have them spluttering into their beer or their gin and tonic or their white, the water, whatever they drink. And they're going to have to engage with you. They're going to have to engage with you or dismiss you and tell you where you're wrong. And I don't believe we are wrong. I genuinely don't. There are more and more scientists. And what's really exciting at the moment is the number of young academics that are really getting into this stuff now. The old school are dying. The materialist reductionist guys, the guys that are stuck in the science of 130 years ago are dying off. There's a realization now that we need to join the dots. So I know, for instance, now there are scientist associates of mine who are now working on the quantum effects of biological systems, this kind of thing. So suddenly the doors are being blown off. The doors of perception aren't just opening, they're being blown open. So that will be the events and everything else as well. So again, come over, speak to me if you can get to it and everything else. So thanks for everybody listening. So I'm just going to be looking over here because I, I need to look at some of the, some of any questions that have come up or anything. So I'm just flicking through. There's, there's a lot. Wow. Hey, guys, this is exciting. Um, okay, let's just see if there's any uh, questions that you've asked. Um, Right. Yes. Uh, Perceptions Today has asked, will you be including insights from the DMTX interview you saw this week? Yes, I will. Um, this was um, uh, an online event, a live online event involving Andrew Gallimore. Again, the Andrew Gallimore that's going to be involved with us in the event over here, over there in, uh, in America. Um, and also a number of other people. Um, Rick Strassman, for instance, was involved. Now, Dr. Rick Strassman, is the guy who in the mid-1990s um, did a series of research into dimethyltryptamine with volunteers um, at the University of New Mexico. And what he was wanting to know was when you take DMT, you know, what experiences do you have? And his guy, The Spirit Molecule, his book, The Spirit Molecule, was an extraordinary read, and I strongly suggest you read this book. But it's been progressed since then. And what has been happening is over recent years, there's been research 
funded, part funded by, I think, the UK government and part funded by a, a billionaire called Anton Bilton, who was also involved in the, the online discussion um, called the Tiring, uh, the, called the, the Tiringham Initiative. And one of um, what they did was they've put up the money and at Imperial College in London, there's been a series of individuals, a group of individuals who have volunteered to take dimethyltryptamine intravenously. Now, DMT or dimethyltryptamine, as some of you will know, is probably the most powerful hallucinogenic substance known to man. It's in everything. It's in plants. It's in your bloodstream. It's in your liver. It's in your spinocerebral fluid. And I argue it's in your brain. And I think there's powerful evidence to argue it's in your brain. And again, if you're interested in the evidence, it's in your brain. Look up some of the work of people like Jimo Borgigian at the University of Michigan in terms of the fantastic work she's doing in terms of this. Um, but going back to the argument, so that they then have these individuals take the drug intravenously and then report back what they experienced. And one of the guy that was there who was the experiencer is a very good friend of mine called uh, Carl Hayden Smith. And Carl, again, has been a guest on my show in the past, at least twice, I think. And Carl is part of my group, not my group, our group, when we meet in London regularly and we chat and we discuss ideas. And Carl's experiences with these entities are, are, are extraordinary, um, as, as, as were the rest of the group when they give feedback. As far as I know, they, it's going to be posted or has been posted for you to watch if you wish to watch it on, uh, on YouTube. But I'll be discussing the implications of this specifically. So thanks for that perceptions today. Um, uh, Will Carr has asked me, Anthony, would you say it's like freshness? Well, I don't know what we mean by freshness. <laughs> Do we mean that on this hot, sticky day, I'm smelling fresh? Well, probably, hopefully so, but we never know. Um, or are these fresh ideas? In which case, yes, I think they are incredibly fresh ideas and very important. Um, right, let's um, continue down. Um, sorry, I've lost my place again because I'm incompetent like that. Um, yes, again, as perceptions today say, you know, DMT is an incredible experience and it does change people totally. But there is an argument to say that any noetic experience changes people completely. Um, my friend, uh, Dr. Penny Satori, has written a book on how um, near-death experiences change the way you see the world. Uh, again, a book well worth ch checking out. But one of the central things within the work of people like Carl Hayden Smith is how DMT experiences change your worldview, which is not surprising, is it? You know, if you suddenly go into another world that is real, more real than this one, and when you come back, you realize that this is this is effectively a facsimile of a, a, a much deeper, more extraordinary world, that's going to change you forever. You know, there's no question about that. You will. Um, and I think that's what's happening, I think, with everybody that takes DMT. Or more specifically, 5-MeO-DMT, which is the excretion from the sonarian toad. And it's an excretion that toads make when they're frightened of things. But that's even more powerful. And I would argue, and I just thought of this now, so you're seeing this live as, as Anthony P uses his madness, that the the de when you, you take DMT, I think you attune into demonic consciousness. And I think you perceive the world as the daemon sees it. But when you take 5-MeO-DMT, you perceive the world as the uber daemon or the godamon perceives it. Because people I know who have taken 5-MeO say that within when you take DMT, you're still yourself. You have this concept of these things are happening to you. The entities are talking to you. You are in this space. Whereas with 5-MeO-DMT, you are the space. You become the space, you, you become everything. You have what's called the oceanic experience, which people like Peter Ospensky used to argue about. The idea that your, your physical body expands outwards and encompasses reality. And you realize that of course, we are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. And of course we know from most religions, the teachings of religions is find the God within. And I'd argue this is exactly what you're doing when you, you experience 5-MeO-DMT. So, and again, if anybody's interested in 5-MeO-DMT, another previous guest on my show is Dr. Dr. Um, Martin Ball, 
who lives up in Oregon. And Martin has written a whole fascinating series of books on 5-MeO, also worth checking out. And his angle is quite interesting as well. Um, so check that one out as well. So in terms of this, um, yeah, as, as they say, you know, we got the word now, the word for the day is freshness. Maybe we should do that. Um, yeah, and, and of course, with perceptions today, just to let everybody know as well, with um, with the guy behind that who likes to remain anonymous, um, he um, he and I we regularly I'm regularly a guest on his perceptions today program, and we we spend two or three hours talking. So again, you can log in, and it's much more interactive than this because you can speak and you can talk. Whereas now I'm just reading your messages. So check out perceptions today, and we're planning to do another event probably in July or August as well. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that Myron Dial, um, who is the guy I mentioned, I think is is the next guest in the next couple of days in terms of um, perceptions today. So check that one out. Myron is extraordinary experience. He is a living example of my Damon Adelon dyad. And again, Myron will be at my talk on the Damon. And I will have somebody who is in direct contact with their Damon at that event. Okay, and somebody suggesting here, right, that, um, yes, I agree, Will, uh, Will Carr. Uh, quantum mechanics fantasy is starting to become reality. Yeah, it is. You know, and I, I argue, um, I have something I call the, the, the egregorial, the egregorion. And by the egregorion, I mean that it seems that scientists are creating subatomic particles by their anticipation of them. We know that in quantum mechanics, there's something called a collapse of the wave function, whereby a wave function, which is a statistical wave, nothing more, it's not physical, it's a statistical wave stating whether an object or a particle will be in one place or another. When the object or when the wave is measured, and I'll be discussing this in detail in my presentation, my my uh, in, uh, my um, intensive, when the wave is measured, it comes down into a point particle and it selects one location or another. Now, if that is the case, can we extrapolate them from that to say, well, do all subatomic particles do that? Well, they do. And in the in the ex in the talk, I'll be talking about not just subatomic particles, but um, atoms, big atoms and big molecules do it as well. But that's an aside. But the issue is. Could it be that subatomic particles come into existence? Their very nature comes into existence by the anticipation of a scientist. And I give an example of this, that um, way back when they were looking for the muon, which is one of the, the subatomic particles they were trying to find, um, they knew it was theoretical, but it was it's completely theoretical. It wasn't as if, you know, they had evidence it was there. It was just theoretically there. And then one day they find it. And E. 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 Ray Rabbi, who was the quantum physicist involved, who was a Nobel Prize winner, Isaac Rabbi, turned around and said, who ordered that? Because he was so shocked. It was as if somebody had ordered a pizza or a takeaway and it just appeared. And I've, I've done some analysis of this and the amount of subatomic particles that just come in at our bidding, the particle zoo we are creating by our anticipations of it. You know, for instance, I'll give a classic example of just how weird it all is. Max Planck in 1900, when he came up with his quantum theory, as he called it, it was an act of desperation. He couldn't make anything else work. The maths didn't work. Nothing worked. And then he thought, oh, my God, well, maybe energy comes in little packets or quanta. And it worked. But it wasn't through the science. It was through his anticipation of it. Now, could it be that with subatomic particles, that's why they're getting weirder and weirder? Because we are anticipating things that are weirder and weirder. And in fact, in reality, whatever reality is, it's much more simple than that. It's what Einstein called hidden variables. The idea that all this kind of quantum madness, because Einstein never agreed with a lot of quantum mechanics, he considered it to be crazy. That's why he came up with his EPR, Einstein Podolsky Rosen thought experiment to disprove quantum mechanics and the, the observer effect, as, as did, surprisingly enough, um, um, uh, Schrodinger when he came up with the Schrodinger's cat experiment. 
That was to dis the belief that consciousness was directly involved, not the other way around. So Einstein, as Einstein once said, I do not believe that the moon doesn't exist if I'm not looking at it. But Einstein was proven wrong. 1964, John Bell, CERN, Irish CERN physicist, does the calculation, does the maths of it. Non-locality. Then in 1980, 1981, Alain Asperg, Dalabard and Gerard at uh, the French University of uh, the French Paris Institute of Optics did, a, did an experiment where they proved that Einstein's EPR paradox was right, but they were putting it forward as a paradox that was ridiculous. So yet again, we have things that are ridiculous that seem to come into existence. Again, as um, the very famous Richard Feynman said uh, many years ago, that um, don't try to understand quantum physics and trying to figure out quantum physics because you'll fall down a hole you you'll never escape from because nobody understands quantum mechanics. They can observe the effects and what they do, but nobody understands it. So it could be that the world is getting weirder and weirder before we suddenly, like the medieval schoolmen with their mad ideas and their epicycles, Copernicus comes along and Kepler and changes all of that. And I think that's what's going to happen with quantum mechanics. There's going to be a breakthrough and the breakthrough is going to be the relationship between consciousness and information. And when that breakthrough is made, wow, we're going to fly. We need to get away from this physical worldview. It's much greater than that. So thank you for that as well. So that's good. Um, and OCOC2341, strongly recommend collaboration with Rizwan Verk. His data expertise yields unique, in, unique insights into simulation theory. His input could enrich your work significantly. I agree totally. Um, I've got a couple of, I've got some of Rizwan's work that I need to read. Um, I think his work does sound very, very intriguing. And again, he can, he can add to it. But as long as these guys don't know I exist, they're not going to interface with me. They need to be aware of what I'm doing to realize I'm not just some mad new age wacko. I'm somebody that has, has, has got something vaguely valid to say and I need their help. So no, I'll be seeking him out. Um, and then Will Carr says, maybe you need to sit in front of the plane to stop the jet lag because you're not in the back. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, yeah, that, that would be very good. The main problem is that um, because I can't sit at the front of the plane because they're paying for my ticket over there. And of course, it's the cheap, cheapest possible ticket. Uh, and because I was quite late there, I'm right at the back of the plane. I couldn't be much further back. <laughs> so um, I'm going to be pretty, pretty, pretty shattered, I would think. You know, it's... Um, I'm in my 70th year, I'm 69, I'm 70 at my next birthday, and really it's it's heavy going. Uh, as Graham Hancock said to me, because he's in his early 70s, and he was saying he was feeling the the pressure of it all, because you get to a certain age and you start to think, oh God, is, is, do I really want to do this? But of course I really want to do it because I love it. Um, okay. Um, oh, and Mike Fiorito, great Mike. Hi Mike, I hope uh, everything is great with you. Um, by the way, Mike Fiorito is a fantastic writer. Check out his work. His writing is extraordinary. I love his books. I love his short stories. Check him out. He's really, really good. Um, and Mike has said, I know Alan Stanfield very well. Funny. Well, that would be really good. Uh, maybe we can link him. Hey, maybe we can get him interviewed. You know, that would be really good, wouldn't it? Try that out, Mike. We'll think we'll do that. Um, and Neil Rushton's in the room. Hi, Neil. Again, Neil is somebody that you need to check out, guys. Neil Rushton is Dr. Neil Rushton. He's an archaeologist. He um, has been on my show. He's a friend of mine. Uh, he lives up on Wirral, where I come from. Um, he's attended a number of my events in the past. And Neil is very interesting because he experiences Charles Bonnet syndrome, something that is central to my hypothesis about reality and the egregores. And again, Neil has been a wonderful source of information about Charles Bonnet syndrome and the way certain people see entities. Their brains see their, their doors of perception or the windows of perception become cleansed and they start to see the entities I suspect are around us all the time and they start to perceive them. And of course, the argument is then, then the hallucinations. But of course, nobody knows what hallucinations are. So when somebody turns around to you and says, well, oh, it's just an hallucination cite my labeling theory on this the labeling theory is give it a label preferably latin or greek and if you give it that 
you'll surprise people will believe you because you're a scientist. It's like the word idiopathic. I'm tempted to call the word idiopathic science. Idiopathic in medical terms, like idiopathic epilepsy, is epilepsy that the doctors have not got a clue what's causing it. And we have idiopathic science because they don't really know what's causing this. They don't know why, how the universe came from a, a point 13.8 billion years ago and everything just expanded out super fast. You know, and the only reason they say it was super fast, the inflationary period, because that's to make the maths work. They don't know what really happened. Of course they don't. You know, I don't like using the term they, but there is an awful lot of hubris out there. There's awful lot of self-congratulation, you know, the, the, the Brian Cox world of we know everything and you know nothing kind of thing. Whereas they don't actually know that much. Um, they're treading on water. Uh, thin ice, even better, is even better analogy. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's that. Um, oh, is that PM or, oh, that's somebody answering from somebody else, isn't it? Yeah, that'll be PM. Um, and then Alex asked about what about them non-human intelligences? Yeah, well, um, yeah, basically what about them? Yeah, they are interesting and intriguing. Are they independent of us? Are they created by us? Are they co-created by us? Do they use our anticipations like the egregorians, the subatomic particles, I say, are coming into existence? Are they creating, are they using our anticipations of them to come into existence? And this will be a central part of my talk on egregores. And I'll be citing examples of how this seems to be the case. In particular regard here, I need to, you should need to check out the word, the work of another previous guest on my show called Paul Eno. And um, Paul Eno is a paranormal researcher in Rhode Island in, in uh, New England. And some of the experiences he's had definitely link these entities in some way to plasma and electrical fields. So it seems to be that they use plasma to come through into this world. So the question is, what are they really? Are they just aspects of us? Who knows? But there's a lot of area that we need to look into here. And of course, there is the argument, should we be looking into these things anyway? Are we allowed to? And I have the term I use a lot called the archons. And of course, the archons are the beings that um, seem to scotch everything. Because of course, central to everything I'm talking about now is a particular religious belief system called Gnosticism. And some of you may have spotted this. I'm not religious in any shape or form. But I think that Gnosticism has some basic truths within it. And I think a lot of the ancient teachings have carried through Gnosticism throughout the centuries, because they have the concept of this is a fake place. This is the kenoma. What is real is the pleroma, which is the fullness, which is the reality behind this reality. Or as my good friend Miguel Connor um, the great Gnostic scholar calls it the, the God beyond the God, the God behind God. Um, so this is, again, the idea of the daemon and the godemon. You know, we, we are living within flesh machines. We are trapped within this flesh machine. And of course, we are programmed to exist within this simulation. So therefore, the stuff I'm talking about is almost breaking out of the simulation, because what I'm saying is that this is going against everything that your brain is telling you is true. You know, everything is t wanting to tell you that there is an out there, that space is out there, that there's a distance out there, because that's how we need to survive here. And that's an important concept. Uh, right. Oh, well, yes. Yeah, it would take one day and nine hours to drive there. Well, it'd be great if you could. $2,500 to fly. Jeez. Yeah, that's not... Um, yeah, well, as, as Sushi Sushi says, you know, um, I hope my daemon is called Matt. Well, it could be. I mean, your daemon, uh, daemon names are quite strange. The individuals who contacted me over the years who are in contact with their daemon, there are some interesting names out there. Um, for instance, uh, and it's quite a, a strange coincidence that Myron Dial's daemon is called Charon. And of course, my concept is cheating the ferryman. And the name of the ferryman is Charon. So the very first daemon that contacts me is called Charon. And I was thinking, woo, this is just weird. And then I think, but this is how it works. I have a term, I call it synchrondipity. 
The synchronicities are out there all the time, and it's just part of the program. The program just calls this. It, our attention notices them. Yes, of course they do. It's attention bias. But the synchronicities are so weird, and the synchronicities that have happened to me over the years have just been beyond mathematical comprehension. You can apply maths to it. So you can apply maths to any synchronicity or any coincidence, you know, because you can. You just increase the odds, but it still can happen. And of course, anything that can happen will happen in some set of circumstances. So, you know, who knows? But um, OK. And will uh, so what about catatonia and lucid dreaming connection? Should sedative act the same? Yeah, catatonia and lucid dreaming are quite fascinating. And I suppose when you're talking about catatonia, the uh, Alexei, what you're really talking about probably is sleep paralysis. And again, if you're interested in sleep paralysis and the work on sleep paralysis, um, my great friend Samantha Lee Treasure is doing some fascinating work in this area. She she has sleep paralysis and she has out of the body experiences. And she's in the process of writing two books on this subject at the moment. Also, there's a good friend of mine, Jade Shaw, who's doing some fascinating teaching exercises at the moment in terms of um, sleep paralysis and out of body experiences. But of course, the one person that you really need to check out, who is a guy I admire so much, who again has been a guest on my previous shows, is a guy called Graham Nichols. And Graham Nichols is probably one of the most extraordinary teachers of out of body experiences I know. He's very grounded. He's very scientific in his approach. He's very method methodical in his approach. And Graham and I will be doing an event together over a weekend in, in October in London. Um, we've got the dates. It's just a matter of now getting the location together. And I will post about that when that happens, because Graham and I together, it could be quite, quite an interesting weekend for you there. Um, and so, thanks, Will. Um, I've been plugging your name on in different shows. Will, I'm that, I'm so I so appreciative of that. This is the only way my name's going to get out there is by you guys helping me. You know, I I don't have a big publisher or anything. You know, or publishers. I don't. I don't have that kind of backing. I don't have people I know that can help in any way. The only way people can help is by getting the ideas out there. And ultimately, that's all I want. You know, I want the ideas out there. I don't care about me. This is not me anymore. The ideas are much more important. I'm far too long in the tooth now for it. I'm just keeping myself running into the ground before I pass on into a new um, a new iteration of what I call the Bohmian IMAX, which, again, if you don't know the term, read my books and you'll understand what I mean by the Bohmian IMAX. OK, so. Um, I just, Alex again has said, I just want to talk NDE with my friend. Should there be a, a, pod, a load podcast and how should it be called? Oh, I see. Yeah, that's an interesting idea, isn't it? Why you want to do an NDE based podcast. Yeah, that's yeah. If you can think up a really good name for that, um, I'll give that some thought. I'll give that some thought. That could be quite interesting. Um, yes, I agree, Will. We do need a change from the word holographic. I think it's good. I think it should be called something different. I agree. That's why I'm called. That's why I'm using Andrew Gallimore's terminology of instantation, because instantation is a far more powerful term. Because, for instance, Andrew and and me to a lesser extent really has a problem with the word simulation, because the simulation suggests it's a copy of something else, and it's not. It's much more than that. Much, much more. So we need to come up with a better term, and I think the instantive universe. And this is one of the things I'll be presenting when I do my talk and introducing the instantive universe and the instantive model, because I think this is the way forward. One could argue that it is holographic in nature. I mean, the, the, the issue is that hologram, it is holographic. There is elements of, of holograms that suggest this. And again, I keep name dropping. I know, but it's what I do. Um, one of the previous guests on the show is a fascinating guy. Um, who I've met a couple of times and has actually visited me here in my home in West Sussex, is um, a guy um, called um, Dr. Art Funkhauser, who is an American who lives in Switzerland. And Art is a Jungian analyst. But what is powerful about Art is that um, he is also a scientist. He's a quantum physicist. And indeed, his area of specialism is holograms. And Art is an extraordinary man because his area of interest and it was art that got me into the initial idea of writing my first book and coming with the idea of cheating the ferryman, because art wrote an academic paper 
in the mid 1990s called the dream theory of deja vu. And in the dream theory of deja vu, Art argued that a deja vu sensation is that you have had a dream recently. And of course, we know when we have dreams, we forget them, but they remain subliminal. You know, they're, they're just below the surface. And then the dream is precognitive. So what happens is you then encounter the events that you encountered in your dream. And that's why you have the kind of weird recognition, but inability to recognize the circumstances by which you last experienced it. And Vernon Nepe, who is the probably the world's leading researcher, Dr. Professor Vernon Nepe, leading researcher in uh, the um, deja vu or deja sente, deja breathe, deja, um, deja uh, already lived. Um, well, it'll come to me in a second. But the idea is that clearly you're seeing something for the first time, but you've already seen it. And the definition that Nervena Nepe came up with is, and I, I can only paraphrase it, but it's something on the lines of a recognition of a set of circumstances that you have experienced before in an indeterminate part of your past. And that's the important thing. It's indeterminate. You don't know when it was. And Art says it's a dream, which sort of reinforces my cheating the ferryman hypothesis, but doesn't. And I'll come into that later. But the interesting thing is that he... He, he, he turned around to me and he said, you know, it's a dream. And, it's pre and I said, but that means you're precognizing, you're precognizing the future. How does that happen? How does your brain know about an event that you've yet to experience? And of course, Art didn't have an answer to that. And my answer, and I can explain that, my cheating the ferryman explains it completely and utterly what's taking place. You've lived this life before. And you're re-experiencing it. And what's happening is you're accessing the daemon memories located in your non-dominant hemisphere. And you're accessing those memories across your corpus callosum. And you have the memory. And the rec what happens is your corpus callosum, your non-dominant hemisphere, recognizes the scene a split second before your dominant hemisphere cognizes it. And there's a delay and there's a kind of a double echo. And they say that, you know, a deja vu experience is probably precognitive up to about three or four seconds sometimes. But there are other people I know that have precognitive deja vus and they know what's going to happen next. And that is particularly extreme. It's intriguing because modern science can't explain that. So they ignore it. They pretend it doesn't happen. Yeah, I'll guarantee that all of you have had precognitive experiences at some time in your life or precognitive dreams. But of course, modern science has no answer to that. So instead of actually looking into it, they ignore it. Hmm. So. OK, so crawling down. Sorry about that. I'm scrolling as I'm doing so. Sorry about my seeing my um, odd profile. Um, I just hope I'm not going to miss anybody here because there's quite a few questions here. Um, yeah, I've got there. So there's the. Yeah, Michael Tsarian, yeah. Alexi is talking about, I do a podcast with Michael Tsarian. Uh, yeah, Michael. Michael's a fascinating guy. He's, he's interviewed me a couple of times and I like his work. Yeah, he's um, he's quite interesting um, in his ideas. He could be quite an interesting person to talk to, I think, that. Do you, you think materials, Gavin has asked me, do I think materials could pass between different dimensions? It depends what we mean when we use the term dimensions. And it is profoundly important when people use the term dimensions, they use them in such a flippant way. We have to understand what we really mean. We're talking about dimensions in space and time. And the issue is that, you know, we have breadth, depth and height. They're the three dimensions of space. Then we have time as the fourth dimension. But there could be dimensions that run at right angles to this dimension. Orthogonally is the technical term. And in fact, it's interesting that if you draw, you, you, how you do this, you'd say you draw, you have a point. 
and then you draw a line to another point and that's aligned so that's one dimension then you draw right angles to that and you complete it and you get a square so that's two dimensions then you go at right angles so you've gone right angles to go up then you go right angles into space to create a to create a um a box don't you or a cube then and this is where it starts to get interesting then imagine drawing then from the points of the cube outwards at right angles what you're then moving into is the fifth dimension and the fifth dimension and a fifth di five dimensional object is called a tesseract and tesseracts you can see models of tesseracts and in fact if anybody's seen the movie uh, interstellar there's one sequence called the tesseract sequence um whereby the 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 central character is looking back at the life of his daughter from orga orthogonal time from what actually is minkowski time technically after um herman Mis minkowski and minkowski's time is kind of how you would see time if you were looking down on time as a series of tesseracts almost um and christopher nolan was very keen to get that image across in in the movie um because he looks back on his daughter's life and he sees it interfacing in different ways and i'd argue that's the world as it is seen by the daemon and again i would extrapolate and say that these different dimensional perspectives are the different dimensional perspectives um an edelon lives within three dimensions uh, lives in four dimensions a daemon lives within five dimensions uh, within five dimensions a godemon lives within six dimensions of space-time and uh, the ubermon sorry and the godemon exists within all dimensions of space and time so again you you have the model how the model works in terms of dimensions but coming back to your question do i believe that objects can come through from one dimension to another well i cite the example here of edwin abbott in his famous book um flat world where a square who was the character um that realizes he's living in this two-dimensional world they see at one stage they see a sphere a sphere in three dimensions comes through their two-dimensional world and if you think about it what would they see well what they would see actually is a small point that would get bigger and bigger and bigger and they get smaller and smaller and smaller again and disappear and that's what they'd see but it's a sphere but because their perceptions are only three two-dimensional that's all they can perceive we are attuned to perceive in three dimensions uh, three dimensions and possibly four within the time dimension so can an object travel through from one to the other well it's difficult to say but if you're talking about things like a ports and things um who knows um i don't believe in a ports by the way i think it's sleight of hand um there are very few of these people i believe them they're nearly 99.9999 percent convergence um and they're doing it like Sai Baba you know he's just he's, he, he, he's it's a magic trick it's a magic trick and people fall for it but people fall for it all the time you know uh, this is what as Mencken said you know uh, nobody ever got poor by underestimating the intelligence of the public you know it's the way it is so so let's see let's carry on now um Unfortunately, because I keep having to go back to the but the end and then um, okay, so hello Silvana, thank you. Sorry you're late, but um delighted you're here. It will be, by the way, that all this will be recorded and I'll put it up as a proper broadcast uh, uh later today or over the weekend. Nothing is finite, not even words. Is that right? Well, finite is a is a, is an interesting word. It's like eternity. Um, it's one of these words that we 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 use, um, but we're not we're not quite sure what we mean by eternity. I came across a wonderful wonderful description a few years ago, which I've used a couple of times, which I absolutely love, and it's the how to define eternity. And the the person turned around and said that somewhere in the center of Asia there is a cube of solid or iron and it's uh, a thousand foot high 
and a thousand foot wide. And every thousand years, a little bird flies over and in its beak is um, uh, a scarf of the finest silk. And it drags the scarf and the silk across the top of the cube every thousand years. When that cube is down to nothing, the first millisecond of the first second of the first minute of the first hour of eternity has begun. And I think that's extraordinary. That really starts to make you think when we really talk about finite, infinity. And of course, there are different infinities. There are different mathematical infinities as well. You know, you look at the word of boy Euler and people like that. So it's mathematically quite fascinating. If you're interested in infinities, by the way, uh, and, and things, the most wonderful book worth reading is Godel Escher Bach by a guy called Douglas Hofstadter. And what he does in this is he, he links recursion and things going on forever. And he cites the music of Bach because Bach does that. Bach goes back on himself. It's beautiful how clever Bach is. Uh, and then Godel, who is the mathematician, another mathematician who worked on infinities and, and recursions. And, and then you have um, Escher, the, uh, the Dutch painter. Of course, you know, with the kind of like the waterfall going round and round and everything else as well. These are all things that give us the idea of what eternity is really like when we talk about this. But um, fascinating areas of uh, discussion. Thank you for that. Um, yes, as a Gavin, I agree. We haven't determined what we call an hallucination of course, which, of course, we haven't. It's just a term. You know, again, a book worth reading in terms of this is the late, great, late, great Oliver Sacks, whose last book before he died was called Hallucinations. And indeed, that has a whole section on Charles Bonnet syndrome. Uh, again, well worth checking out. And if you want to have some fun, his um, uh, Oliver Sacks' book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, is a classic, well worth reading. And there's one one particular section in that um, called A Passage to India, which is proof if ever you wanted to hear proof of my cheating the ferryman hypothesis, just read that chapter and then read my book. Right. That one time I was abducted by aliens. Yeah. Excited to see you. I'll hopefully say hi when you're at CITD. I'm not sure I'll know what you look like, but um, tell me, just come over and say who you are. Right. Guy Capro's Capro's Capozala. Do you have any new books coming out? Um, I do indeed. Um, comparatively breaking news. Um, I've recently been approached by one of my publishers um, to write another book. Um, and it's only the second time that's, ha that's happened that a publisher has come to me to write a book. The previous time was they approached me because they wanted to write me to write the book on Philip K. Dick, um, the American science fiction writer. But I've said yes. Um, and it's going to be my absolute drilling into to the nth degree the near-death experience so i'll be doing everything from the history to the neurology to the experiential to the phenomenological the whole but i'm doing, trying to do something completely radically different to what anybody else has done in terms of it and i'm going to approaching it from the science and extrapolating from the science as to what the ndes really mean and i've got a few interesting contacts in terms of this, uh, like uh, Dr. Melvin Morse, who was on my show a few months ago, is going to be useful. And hopefully through him, I'll be able to speak to people like Ken Kenneth Ring um, and various other people. And of course, Evelyn uh, El Sasa Valerano has also been on the show as well. He's also a top researcher in NDEs as well. So um, I'm looking forward to that. Jason from the Archa Archaics channel is great. Thanks, Phil. I'll, you know, if you can get him to call, can put me in contact with him. Um, high philosophy and science. Um, a lot of strange things in the life of humans. There certainly is. Uh, right. Alex Lexi saying, my catatonia remark is more about it is highly intense states. And in Anthony Peak. Anthony Peake's opening the door of perception is an interesting fact about catatonia that you can make that make a person you can make a person exit catatonia. Um, I don't recall that. Um, I, forgive me on that. I don't remember writing about that, but it, I, you know, I don't remember every single thing I wrote. I try to, but not all the time. Um, do you believe that you'll live life over and over till you've lived the life purposefully, Gavin? What a brilliant question. That is exactly what I believe. Exactly, you. The, the parallel here is with the movie Groundhog Day. And again, um, I interviewed um, the guy who wrote Groundhog Day. 
um, Danny Rubin many years ago, by the way, is one of the funniest interviews I've ever done. He was hysterically funny. And the central principle, I mean, even Danny himself didn't realise this. You know, I don't know if you know this, but Danny told me the reason uh, he came up with the idea of Groundhog Day was that he was in a cinema watching a, 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 a film with his girlfriend. And he just wondered about the characters and the actors. And he thought the actors all know how the story is going to end. If they did know how the story was going to end, how would they react? So it wasn't anything mystical. People turn around and say he was doing Buddhism and everything else. He wasn't. It was just an idea he had. And he extrapolated from that. But you'll know that in the movie, um, the central character, Connors, who's a filmmaker, uh, sorry, he didn't sorry, a filmmaker at all. He's a, he's a meteorologist. And he goes down to Puxatawney in Pennsylvania for the annual February, is it 4th, 5th, something like that, celebration, whereby there's a guy called Punxsutawney Phil, who is this little rodent groundhog. And if he comes out of his hole and, and stays awake, it means that winter's going to end early or something. You know, it's one of these things, but it's a big event that they do. And he goes down there and he's very cynical and everything else. And he goes to bed that night um, and he's been in the hotel one night before and he wakes up and he's hearing Buddy, um, Sonny and Cher singing, uh, I Got You, Babe. And he gets up the next morning and he hears, I've Got You, Babe, on the radio again. And he thinks, oh, what idiots. And he goes downstairs and everybody says exactly the same things to him as um, as they did the day before. And there's one really funny sequence where um, he's really getting confused about this. And he turns around to the landlady and he says, <laughs> he says, um, do, what uh, have you have you have you? have you got any have you ever had deja vu and she said oh i don't know but we could check in the kitchen and see if we can get you some uh, which i thought was quite a beautiful line and what he does is he goes through the day in complete confusion but then he wakes up the next day and it's the same day again and the next day and initially he's horrified but then he realizes he can use it to his advantage and what is actually happening i've argued in my writings is that what is technically happening there is that he's become a daemon. He's become his own daemon, or the daemon and the Adelon have come together. So the Edelon or the Adelon has the memories of the previous days that the daemon normally has, because of course, take days for lives. So he goes through the next day, and then he realizes that he has power. He realizes he can use his knowledge to gain things, to bed the girl. And he does all these kind of selfish things. And over day after day after day, he realizes that this is not what he wants. So he thinks, is there other ways I can I can impress the girl? Uh, Andy McDowell, I think it was. Yeah. And what he does is he starts to read up things so he can impress her. So he checks up the day before what's her favorite movie. And then he takes her out from me and says, you know, what my favorite movie is. And of course, she goes, my God, that's my favorite movie. And then he realizes he can impress her by doing all these wonderful things. So he starts to teach her. He teaches himself how to play the piano and the violin. And then he starts teaching himself foreign languages. So he's changing from being selfish to being wanting to learn. And then that knowledge then changes him. And suddenly he wants to use his knowledge. No, then he, no, he goes to a period where he tries to commit suicide many, many times. Uh, <laughs> that's quite funny. Some of the attempts he has on suicide, of course, it never works. He wakes up the next day. You know, one of the lines when he's driving along the railway lines and he goes, doesn't your mum turn around and say all the things you shouldn't do? You shouldn't pick, you know, you shouldn't do this and shouldn't drive on the railway lines at night. Um, so anyway, he then starts doing good and he's rushing around the town and he's under the tree to catch the, the boy falling out. He tries to save the, the life of a uh, tramp that's dying. And what's happening is, as the Buddhists would argue, through many lives, he's becoming an avatar. He's becoming a bodhisattva. He's becoming a good human being for doing good, for doing good's sake. Now, the Russian edition, the Russian language edition of my first book, will actually call Groundhog Life. And I think this is what it's about. We live all the lives we can possibly live as ourselves. And in doing so, we end up living the perfect life. Like when you play a computer game, you play the perfect game and then you move on to the next level whatever the next level is so in which case we are all learning and our daemon is the, rep the, the repository of all that information that we already have it's like we have a current account 
which is the life you're living now. But you have a deposit account and the daemon holds the deposit account of all the things that have happened to you. Now, on top of this, and it's very important to realize this, you're reborn as yourself, but everything can change every time. Everything can be different because every decision you make collapses the wave function of another universe that you inhabit. This is, again, uh, Hawking's top-down hypothesis of quantum mechanics. So every time you collapse a wave function, there's a new planet, there's a new world. But other people are just as real. Because remember, at a higher level, they are all you. They're all emanations of the uh, the, Go the Godemon and the Uberdemon. So they're all you. You are everybody. Again, a famous story um, written by John Lennon called Let's Be, Let's Be Frank. Read it if you get hold of it. It's very, very good. But the idea is, you know, that we are everybody. We are one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. So we are helping mankind and we're helping consciousness develop as it goes along. We're all contributing to this. So other people are just as real. And in every universe, it's like this maze and mishmash of overloading ideas. So we're all real. We're all individuated. But at a greater level, we're not. So you live through that life. But remember that your life, the location you were born, the place you were born, was dependent upon your parents, wasn't it? Your parents could have moved anywhere in the world. And in a multiverse, and of course I do the science of the whoever at the third's concept of the, the multiverse and the many worlds interpretation. So your parents could have moved to Australia, as mine could have done. I could have been born in Tasmania. But because my grandmother was ill, they never went. But there'll be a version of me that will have gone to Tasmania and would have been a completely different person. But that, that's not only your parents' decisions, but your grandparents and your great-grandparents and going right through time. So effectively, logically, you could have been born anywhere in the world. There's also the argument that maybe, you know, you may have had different parents at some stage. I don't know. I, I wouldn't know how that would work particularly. But it means you could be physically different. You could look different. But also the argument people turn around to me, but it's a terrible idea because what about poor people that are born with illnesses and they die and everything else? There will be a universe where they won't be born with that illness. They'll be born in a universe where they found a cure for it. They'll be in a universe where their genetic, you know, genetic programming means that they didn't have that disease. Is it just a matter of them being in that universe? Because isn't it more tragic, the idea that a person, child is born, lives for six months in absolute agony and dies? Cheating the ferryman argues that child, there will be a myriad of universes where that child won't die. In fact, the child died in your universe that you witnessed. But there'll be other universes where that child doesn't. And the final thing about cheating the ferryman is when you go, when you, when you die, you move on. You don't lose your loved ones. You don't lose your parents, your grandparents, the people you love in your life. Isn't that the great tragedy? I've lost a couple of days ago. I lost one of my closest friends, tragic under tragic circumstances. I'd love to. I know I'm going to see him again. I know we're going to go through our teenage years again. I know we're going to have the same adventures again or maybe slightly different. And that makes me feel excited, looking forward looking forward to future lives where I don't make the mistakes I made this time, where I don't hurt the people I didn't hurt because my daemon will warn me. So suddenly you don't lose people. They're always with you because they're part of you. Whereas heaven, you go to heaven and you spelled, spend all eternity. Remember saying about eternity? You spend all eternity, what, plucking a harp and, 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 and stirring and looking at God and singing hymns for all eternity? How old are you going to be? What point will you get bored? You know, all these things are so important, you know, in terms of that. And this is what I think cheating the ferryman works for me. It may not work for you, but it works for me. Right. Uh, here we are now. Um, I need to move on because I need to finish in about five minutes. So. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I just missed that one. Somebody posted and I just saw and it's flicked and forget, forgive me for which one of you said it, but they've shown a photograph of me to various friends and they all had deja vu sensations looking at my picture. That's strange because um, funnily enough, people tend to recognize me 
in the strangest of circumstances. I mean, a couple of days ago, I was at a bus stop and somebody came past the car screeched to halt and somebody shouted out Anthony and I didn't react because I thought, well, you know, <laughs> I don't know anybody around here properly. And then he said, Mr. Peak, and I realised it was for me, you know, and it was a friend of mine, Jazz Razul, you know, that just extraordinary. Um, so wonder what that is saying, that maybe in other universes they came across my work and it became of influence to them. And I would love to hope that, that would be the case. Because if my work makes people feel better about their lives, that's great. That's what I want. Um, Jan, Jan Belisky, say I was born in 1993 and will be born again this year in the future. No, you'll get born in that year in 1993. And the book, I explain how that works. No, you'll be born in 1993. But if your parents choose to have met up earlier, you could have been born earlier. Or your parents born later, if your parents met later. Or when they made love and formed you, they did it some other time. So in which case, it may not be 1993. There might be iterations of universes where you're not born in 1993. But generally, within principle, 1993 will be the world you're born in. Because if you're born in a different year, you're going to meet different people totally. You do realize that if you're not, if you not follow a certain path, you will meet different people, which means that you don't necessarily meet the people you want to meet. And this is where your daemon positions you like we have all the time, don't we? That sensation you meet somebody for the first time and you go, I know you. You're going to be so important to me. That's happened so many times in my life. You know, where you just know, just like, you know, somebody's going to be a problem for you. You just sense it. And that's the both the daemon plus also an echo of demonic memory that's that's thinking through. Right. Well, I think um, we're almost there now, I think, which is um, really great. Well, thank you for the questions. It's been absolutely superb. I've really enjoyed it. I hope I haven't gone on too long. Um, I do tend to motor mouth sometimes. Um, and I've just realized that I forgot to actually record it. So I'm going to have to re literally record the recording. But that's not a problem. It doesn't actually run for so long. So it means probably I won't be able to get it up for probably two or three days but I'll get it up early next week. <laughs> As the actress said to the Archbishop, I will not be getting it up next weekend, um, but I will I will post it when I get the opportunity. Um, and all I can say is to everybody, uh, thank you very much for, for listening in. Um, please, please, please let people know about my work. If you know of anybody that can that wants to, that is interested in this kind of stuff and is in the California area next weekend, please come over. Please get them to come over to say hi. Um, I'm sorry that the event is so expensive, but it takes it costs an awful lot of money to stage. But if you can get there, it would be lovely to see you. Come over and say hi. Um, don't be a stranger. Uh, people who know me know that um, I, that's not what I do. It's not, you know, I'm not arrogant. It may sound like I am. It may look like I am, but I'm not. I'm the biggest dickhead in the world. So all the best for everybody. Uh, and thanks for listening in. And um, see you all soon. And again, thanks to my group of close friends who've also spent the time on a Friday afternoon logging in, listening to things that I've, they've probably heard me talk about time and time again. I hope it didn't put you to sleep. Okay, all the best, everybody. Thank you.